Hey folks, welcome to my channel. My name is Connor Riccolati, and if I have diabetes and can fly planes, so can you. The incredible quilt behind me is another story for another day. This is the Flybetic. Flybetic. In this video, I will explain to you how to get something called a medical certificate as a type 1 diabetic. What even is a medical certificate? Why do you even need one if you're going to be a private pilot? Well, according to Federal Aviation Regulations, FAR CFR Part 61.23A, Paragraph 3, Subparagraphs 1 and 3, you must hold at least a third class medical certificate when exercising the privileges of a private pilot certificate, recreational pilot certificate, or student pilot certificate except when operating under the conditions and limitations set forth in blah blah blah. Also, when taking a practical test in an aircraft for a recreational pilot, private pilot, commercial pilot, or airline transport pilot certificate, or for a flight instructor certificate, except when operating under the conditions and limitations set forth in blah blah blah. So, to put it simply, if you want to be a private pilot, you need a class 3 medical certificate. Why class 3? Well, there's class 1 and there's class 2. The class 3 certificate is the lowest class medical endorsement that the FAA will give you. It's kind of the baseline that a private pilot will need. Class 2 is kind of like a step up from class 3. It will allow you to fly for hire. A class 1 medical certificate will let you fly as an airline pilot for one of the big airlines. You may be asking, well, what if I want to get a sport pilot license? In that case, you don't need any class of medical certificate. You only need a driver license. However, you can never go commercial or make any money unless you're acting as an instructor for a sport pilot license. You can never fly at night, you can only fly smaller aircraft, and there are ceiling limitations. Right, so you're smart, you want to leave your options open as a pilot, you want to see where you can go with it, you need a class 3 medical certificate. However, again, there are disqualifying conditions. One of those conditions is type 1 insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. But it's a federal organization, meaning there are waivers for everything. And in our case, there is. You can get something called a special issuance. Normally with a class 3 medical certificate under the age of 40, you only need to renew it every five years. All getting a special issuance means is that you submit special paperwork for your condition. And you renew on a yearly basis. And it's doable. And I did. And so can you. This packet, waving it across the screen because there's personal information on there, is what I had to send to the FAA. Lots of sections. Pretty thick, but doable. And they approved me. I'm going to go over each and every one of these little tabs and explain how you too can submit this paperwork and you can get approved by the FAA to fly aircraft legally. Okay, so quick section on setting yourself up for success. Before you start collecting all of the paperwork that you'll need to submit to the FAA, I want you to think about something. Spoiler, the FAA is going to want a lot of data about your glucose reading. So just a quick note about the equipment that you might want to get to set yourself up for success to get yourself a special issuance. The FAA will accept data from readings from an FDA approved CGM or constant glucose monitor. If you don't know what this is, it's a device that attaches to your body and then gives you readings on your blood sugar every five minutes. The verbiage FDA approved is kind of intimidating. Get yourself a Dexcom G6. That's what I'm using and it's incredibly useful. Like let's not even talk about flying planes for a second. Let's just talk about diabetes management. It's absolutely amazing. They don't sponsor me. In fact nobody does. But if you want to control your diabetes better get a Dexcom G6. I promise you you will never regret it. Just as a side note however if you are using a Dexcom G6 monitor, the FAA will want six months worth of readings minimum in order to consider you for a special issuance. So you can submit data using the finger prick glucose monitor that a lot of diabetics do use, but here's something you have to think about and a quick spoiler about what I'm going to talk about later. When you get a special issuance, the FAA gives you conditions. Several of those conditions involve checking your blood sugar mid-flight. So what's easier? Taking your hands off of the yoke, opening up a pouch where your glucose monitor is, pulling back a little needle, inserting the unused strip into the device, pricking your finger, and looking at your reading. Have you ever tried to check your blood sugar while you're driving? You shouldn't do it, and I'm not saying I have, but it's 
probably pretty difficult. Now imagine if you're experiencing even mild turbulence. You're trying to keep the plane on the same heading, you're trying to keep it at the same altitude and at the right airspeed. Now your hands are off the yoke and you're trying to fumble around with a little glucose monitor. With the Dexcom G6, I really should be sponsored for this, you can just pull out your phone and see what your blood glucose reading was in the last five minutes. And then you can mark the time on a piece of paper because the FAA wants you to record all of that data and send it to them for renewal of your special issuance. Something to think about. I'll leave a link in the description below where you can check out the G6. Talk to your doctor, might be for you. Okay, now to the meat and potatoes. To get a class three medical certificate, or in our case, a special issuance, you'll need to see an aviation medical examiner. Link in the description below where you can look up medical examiners in your area. Uh, quick side note, it's always a good idea to get an examiner who is a pilot themselves. That way they can be sympathetic towards your cause. It does help if they like you when they're sending off your paperwork to the FAA. That said, your diabetes should be well controlled when you do go in to see your FAA medical examiner. Also a link in the description for filling out something called a Med Express form before you go see a medical examiner. But wait, before you do that, you need to get all of your ducks in a row. This is where I talk about crossing your T's and dotting your I's. Let's go over the document that the FAA provides for how to get your initial certification. As we go, we'll incorporate this whole mess. Step one, the airman must demonstrate stability and adequate control verified by CGM data for a minimum of six months. You'll note that the initial certificate consideration requirements document that I'm referencing here talks about getting a class one or two medical certificate. There really isn't a lot of information about getting a class three medical certificate, but what's implied here is that you don't have to have a CGM. However, since to be honest, I really think that all diabetic pilots should be using a CGM, we're going to proceed under the requirements for a class two medical certificate. This is a really good strategy because if you're adhering to those requirements and only applying for a class three, it really makes it look like you got your stuff together. Number two, an airman with a new diagnosis of insulin-treated diabetes mellitus, ITDM, or any concerns regarding their control may require a longer stability period. Number three, submit the following performed within the past 90 days. This is important and I'll address it in the last section. Check out the chapter timestamps below in the section called strategy. Okay, item number one that they want. An initial comprehensive report from your treated board-certified endocrinologist. You can't just use your primary care physician. It has to be an endocrinologist. So this is new here. It says note for initial evaluations, the former Diabetes on Insulin Recertification Status Report, which is now titled Diabetes on Insulin Recertification Status Report, non-CGM, third class option, will not be accepted. This is one of the reasons that we're walking through this for the class two certification, even though we're going for our class three. Okay, so if we scroll down the page and we check out item number one, diabetes history, this is what you're gonna need from your endocrinologist. Just communicate it with them. I'm not going to walk through the whole thing with you. You can check it out yourself. Again, link in the description, but you must make sure that in your chart, after your visit with your endocrinologist, your endocrinologist has touched on every single one of these points. This will include the physical exam as described, the assessment and plan, and the date of the next clinical follow-up. The FAA will require you to go in quarterly. However, for the initial submission, you only need that initial report. Once you receive the special issuance, you'll need to go in every three months. Item number two, you need to get a lab done. This is your initial comprehensive panel that is required from the FAA. So if we scroll down to item number two and look at it in more detail here, we can see that item number two is what makes this little report look so intimidating. That's why there's so many tabs. Here's what they require. Your hemoglobin HbA1c, your CBC complete with your blood count, a lipid panel, LFTs or a liver function test, a microalbumin test, or an albumin to creatine ratio test, a TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone test, a vitamin B12 test, and a potassium test. Item number three, your blood glucose data from the last 12 months. Or if you have a CGM, that data. And there are specific requirements that the FAA will want to see in that data sheet. If you have the CGM, there's an app that you can use where you download reports from within a specific timeline. It should show actual readings from every single day. They require an initial six months at least of data from the CGM. If you only have six months of CGM data, then you need to provide the preceding six months of your finger stick blood test data. And the data should demonstrate consistent and ongoing use. They are looking for time in range from 80 to 180, any excursions below 70 or above 250. Item number five, don't worry about it because you don't have any flight hours. 
For more specific information on item number 4, just scroll down the page, check out paragraph B. Item number 6, an eye evaluation performed within the last 90 days and by a board certified ophthalmologist. Note, an optometrist exam is not acceptable. Again, scroll down to see more information about item number 6 and communicate these points with your ophthalmologist. Make sure that they know to print out this information in your chart so that you can submit it to the FAA. Finally, item number 7, a cardiac risk evaluation. Again, it needs to be performed within the last 90 days and by a board certified cardiologist. Fun fact, the FAA does not require a stress test, but they do require an ECG. However, the cardiologist did send me to a stress test because during the ECG, they found something called sinus bradycardia. There are two Two kinds of people that have it, elderly and generally unhealthy people, and more athletic types. What it means is that my heart rate changes with how I'm breathing. If I'm breathing really slowly or shallowly, like for instance during sleep, my heart rate will slow down to something really, really low, like 37. The doctor just wanted to make sure nothing was wrong with my heart. So if you do have athletically induced sinus bradycardia and you go in for a stress test to get you checked out, just make sure that your cardiologist makes a note on your chart that the sinus bradycardia is caused by athleticism and not from old age and being unhealthy. In this section, I want to go over a couple of asides. One, when you get your special issuance, it will come with very specific descriptions of what exactly you need to be doing to keep that special issuance and or renew it every year. Now, I don't know if everybody's special issuance has the same requirements. And in the interest of that alone, I think for right now, all I'm going to say is the FAA will probably want you to be recording your blood sugar mid-flight much like they want me to be. Other than that, just two more points. If you're using a CGM, you're going to need to provide the FAA with an overlay view week by week of every month for the past six months. Or actually, if you've been using it for a year, then every week of every month for the past year. When you submit that overlay, there are very specific settings on the CGM that the FAA is going to want to see. Make sure that the following settings are turned on on your phone if you're using the Dexcom G6 like I am, so that it shows up this way in the report. Pause the video if you need and take a screenshot, but this is exactly what it should look like. And finally, you're going to need to submit a blood glucose worksheet for CGM use. Seems a little repetitive given that you're showing them the overlay, but this is what they're looking for. You'll need to provide 12 months worth of data, at least six of which need to be on a CGM if you're even using a CGM. Again, link in the description, where you will show the dates from and to that you're using it each month, the percentage of days in that month with CGM data, the time in range, your average blood glucose, or your average sensor glucose, your standard deviation, your coefficient of variation, and your CGM's estimated HbA1c for that month. All right, last section here, just a little bit about strategy. That big sheet that we went over emphasizes getting those clinical results from within 90 days. This can be a challenge, especially if you live out near where I do, and it's hard to find an endocrinologist that can book you within four months. So plan ahead. Find out which doctor is going to be most difficult to book, and then book the other doctors around that doctor. For every bit of data that they're going to want to see that needs to have been within the past 90 days, you want to lump it together strategically as best as you can. And then when you do get it together, go see a medical examiner and send the paperwork off. This is, in my opinion, the best way to ensure success in approval for a special issuance. As one final note, you should know that it does take the FAA a long time to approve these things. I think about five months went by, maybe six, from when I sent the paperwork in with the medical examiner to when I received my approval. And keep these things in mind too. The people looking at your paperwork, they want to approve you. They want you to fly. They don't like denying people. There are a bunch of old medical surgeons who really loved aviation, whose flying days might already be behind them, and they're the ones that are letting the new generations fly. So cross those T's, dot those I's, get in all the paperwork that you should be getting in to ensure your best chance of success. And remember this, this is what my first flight instructor told me. When I was worrying about whether or not I was going to get approved, he said, Connor, remember this, it is your right to fly. In the event that somebody gets denied, there is an appeals process. We don't come to them begging them to let us fly. We come to them and we show them that we can fly because we know we can be safe pilots and we dare them to prove it otherwise. It is your right. Okay, that's it. This was my first video. Uh, if you're still watching, I really appreciate it. And it probably means you have diabetes or a medical condition that might preclude you from getting a medical certificate. I appreciate you watching. I'll 
I'll be using this channel to blog about flying with diabetes and sort of all of the implications behind that. It's a new thing for me. I've never vlogged before. And it's my first time saying this too, but if you like the video, like and subscribe. I'm the Fly Medic.